Welcome back. Thank you for your attention so far. We're going to make this as quick as possible. I'm just going to mention the tools and the essential steps of uh, our analysis of our basic data. And then we're going to start the practice. So once you get your analytic data, the first thing we will do, just like we did for the, our whole genome shotgun data before, is, oh, sorry. First, establish your objective. Be clear about what you want to achieve. If you want to correlate a treatment with a, a set of genes, yeah, be clear that is what you want to, what you want to achieve. And also, start designing your, uh, your experiment so as to control as many other variables as possible. Because as we saw in the previous slide, all these things can affect the number of transcripts for each of, in other words, the transcriptomic profile, the landscape of the, of the gene expression. So if neither of these things are the ones you're trying to correlate, if you're not trying to determine what genes are turned are on and off in a developmental stage, or if you don't want to tr test environmental conditions, or if you want to, or if you don't want to uh, test how epigenetic changes affect uh, gene transcription, then you need to find a way to control this. Also, take into consideration in your experiments the number of repeats that you want that you need. <coughs> At first, it may be just exploratory. You want to see how repeatable, how repeatable your experiment is. If you can get the same number of reads or approximately the same number of reads every time you do the, the experiment, because you could be having sampling problems. You could be having uh, problems in the management of your of your plants in in, in your greenhouse or of your col or of your cultures or of all of these things. They do happen. If you're ha if you're analyzing. Uh, a cell culture, yeah, and you wanted to sample it during the exponential growth phase, yeah, you have to be sure that it's in that exponential phase. Yeah, you have to have a repeatable set of steps that you can ensure that you will have repeatable results every time. So first establish your objective. Then find available resources. Do you have, a, if you're getting sequences and you've decided that RNA-seq is the right path for your, uh, for your objective, then is there a genome reference available? Is there a transcriptome reference available? Are there only other, other external sources that are available? ESTs, other RNA-seq libraries? Is anything else available for your, for your, for your species, for your sample, or even for close relatives? All of these things are going to help you decide which approach to follow. Then, just like we did for genome assembly, quality control. Of course, the quality control is going to be different. Yeah? In this case, we're skipping. We're not going to use K-mer analysis. Why? Because there is a one fundamental thing that changes between sampling sequences from an RNA a sample and sampling sequence from a genome sample. The main thing is that you don't have the same number of copies of every transcript, but you do have the same number of copies of every region in the genome. Does that make sense? That is, for each gene or for each transcript in your RNA RNA seq sample or in, in your RNA uh, RNA extraction, you will have a different number of transcripts per gene. That's your transcript landscape. That's the one thing you're trying to find out. So the KMERS, if we were to do analysis, uh, KMER analysis, the KMERS that belong to the most abundant fragments are going to be overrepresented compared to the KMERS that appear on the least uh, abundant uh, transcript. So you will not have an average across all of them. You will not have a peak across all of them. <coughs> this is important because since it violates that 
essential, uh, the essential requirement of homogeneous coverage across all the sequences. Some sequences in the RNA are going to have more copies than others. Yeah? Then the same uh, analysis methods will not work on your DNA as they would on your RNA. But we can still use similar tools. For example, FASTQC. FASTQC will give you several. Uh, I should have put something here. Right? Let me. Well, cannot find one. We, we may have to create our own. Yeah, but FASTQC, you remember that you had like a, a, one of the tabs was the repeat, the number of repeats. That you that each of the small seven camers seven base per camers were present in your in your library, yeah, and you had you, you expected that there weren't that many uh, duplications, yeah. But in ribosomal RNA, even though you expect little uh, duplications, you do expect more duplications than, than in uh, DNA because some of the transcripts are going to be so abundant in your in your sample. Yeah, that are going to appear as peaks in your graph. Also, if you want to make sure that your ribosomal RNA is, uh, has been correctly depleted during the library construction, you want to make sure that you don't have a tail with some cameras being repeated thousands of times compared to all other, uh, all other cameras. Yeah, if you have that big tail, then that tells you there is some ribosomal RNA contamination there. Also, another way to do this, BLAST. You can simply take a random, a random sample of 100 uh, sequences from your RNA-seq data and BLAST it. And see how many of them hit ribosomal RNA, how many of them hit a close relative to the species that you're looking for, or the exact species that you're looking for. Yeah, that will give you an idea of how, how, how contaminated it is, and if you need to get rid of ribosomal RNA. If you need to get, if by some reason you need to get rid of ribosomal RNA, there are methods to do it. The most efficient one is, is map your reads against a ribosomal RNA database, which are easy to find out. You just Google ribosomal RNA database for eukaryotes or for prokaryotes. You download it, and you use it to map your reads. And then whatever didn't map, that's what you're going to keep for, for the analysis. Because what didn't map is not ribosomal RNA, and you want to get rid of ribosomal RNA. Uh, <coughs> so fast QC control. Also, what we want to get rid of, the same thing as in genome, is we want to get rid of sequencing adapters that could have been left over. and low quality sequences stretches. Uh, that all is part of the trimming process. Then we have the ribosomal RNA removal, it's the one I just mentioned. And then we do another round of FASTQC just to make sure that we got rid of all those uh, things we, got, we wanted to get rid of. These are steps, we have done them. Yeah, I could show you, right now we can run a, a quick test. Uh, from simulated data to just to sh show FASTQC, how it looks for ribosomal RNA. It's not so diff different, but there are a few things that will be different. Yeah, for example, uh, sequence composition per base. It also, it's also not going to be as stable as with genomic RNA, uh, DNA. It's going to be, it's going to show more, uh, more peaks and lows. Yeah, then. We have two, after we do that, we do the quality control, we have two main approaches. Either we do a de novo assembly, or we do an alignment. If we do a de novo assembly, it's because we assume, or we have already made sure, that there is no either reference genome or transcriptome genome reference available for my data. And I need to create one. And since we've already discussed that the, the construction or the, the, the characteristics of a RNA-seq library violate the fundamental principles of de novo assembly for genomes, namely that the KMER distribution is homogeneous across all the sequences, across all those sites, 
then we have to use specialized uh, assembly packages that can deal with this. The most used package is Trinity. It's the most popular one. I would argue the second most popular one is Oasis. Then you have some different things like it by UDE, Spades Mira, Shannon. There are a plethora of different uh, RNA seq assemblers. And not only are assemblers different, but they also can be built using different camera sizes. And this is the other part. Just like we were able to use to choose different camera sizes in genome assembly, we are also able to use different camera sizes for transcriptome assembly. But using different camera sizes in for for one assembly in greatly improves the assembly of transcriptome. Why? Because the most abundant regions will require a smaller camera sizes to be built more accurately. Whereas low abundance regions will require longer camers in order to be assembled faithfully. Right? So we have all these different uh, assemblers. These are just uh, a list of four that I personally use and I would recommend. But uh, most modern approaches they suggest using a combination not only of different assemblers but also different different cameras and doing maybe 10 different assemblies of the same data once you're happy with having 10 different assemblies of all data and you compare the statistics of the assemblies and you realize which one are more stable which one are more alike then you can merge the assemblers using different approaches Basically, what you're trying to do is, from all the different assemblies that you get, using different cameras and different assemblers, etc., you're trying to get a consensus list of transcripts, the one that is most coherent. <coughs> the more? Oh, basically, you compare them among each other. Uh, if you see. Hmm? looking at different metrics. Do you remember the metrics that we, we showed last week? Uh, well, yeah, a couple of days ago uh, about uh, contiguity metrics, continuity metrics, uh, coherence metrics. Yeah, so if you have like good N50s and the N50s are repeated or, or are pretty close to each other in the final output of each of the assemblies or if the number of transcripts that you finish uh, that you obtain after assembly with different camera sizes and different programs is close in each case yeah you don't have any clear outlier yeah then you use those that look more like those and try to merge them to produce what we call a consensus transcript assembly transcript and assembly there are several methods to do this yeah and these are still being developed but basically it just uses clustering sequence clustering just like we use multiple sequence alignment uh, class, the cluster algorithm to find which ones are more like each other we use pretty much the same uh, the same idea to cluster different assemblies and select which are the transcripts that are more representative of each loci of each locus right that's basically what you do in the assembly now the other path is if I do have a genome reference available or a transcript term reference available I can just map the reads to those if I can map the reads to those uh, transcripts then I remove that complexity uh, that complexity step of the novel assembling uh, a transcript on uh, a transcript on from my data that doesn't mean that you don't you cannot do it yes you still can do an assembly just you just don't have to do it and when you align it, yeah, you'll get different kind of information. But the most important part is that your reads are going to align to the coding sequences. That's what you sequence. Now, you can tell me, if you randomly cut your transcripts, yeah, and you sequence them, what is the chance, and this is just a rhetorical question, what is the chance that you got one fragment that contains the end of one exon and the beginning of another. I'm not asking for an exact response. This is a rhetorical question. It's like, 
you're very likely to have those, right? You're very likely to have one piece of DNA or of sequence that contains the end of one exon and the beginning of the other, because in the transcript, when you extract your DNA, they work together. So if you map your RNA-seq data to a genome assembly, what kind of alignment would you expect to happen? Do you think a read with all the reads will align exactly as they are to the genome? Because of the introns. The introns are the ones who, who, who are going to make us split some reads into two pieces, the previous exon and the next exon. And the, the introns could be very large. Yeah, so we need an aligner that is aware of these gaps. It's aware of introns. We cannot just use any aligner as we would with genomic sequence. But, and this is a big but, if we are using a transcriptome as a reference, do we need to worry about introns? No. Why? Because the transcriptome assembly or the transcriptome reference has already been depleted of introns. These are mostly the coding sequences. Now, that doesn't mean that in some cases, some RNA seq sequences will still have some intron sequence left over because of a wrong splicing, uh, because we uh, collect, we extracted some free messenger RNA along with our messenger RNA. Uh, all these things could happen, but they are not very likely. If they appear, they appear in very low numbers, but it can still happen. Right? It's, it's something to be aware of. So, a few examples of aligners are star, top hat, high sub 2. These are gap aware aligners. Because the most typical example is that you don't have a transcriptome assembly or reference to, to map your reads, you have a genome. And when you have a genome, you need to be aware of these gaps. Now finally, and this is not here, but I'm going to mention it. Finally, you may or may not have an annotation for your reference genome. You may or may not have it. So these are the different uses of aligning your transcriptome or your RNA-seq to a reference genome. If you want to annotate it, the RNA-seq alignment will give you clues as to where the ex exons are. Also, the most important thing is that it will help you delimit the boundary between exons and introns. And that is something any genome assembler or any genome annotation tool will be able to use to improve the accuracy method of intron exon boundaries and to determine which regions that haven't been targeted or haven't been localized uh, or haven't been targeted to map RNA-seq are still potentially coding because you have the correct intron exon boundaries identified. From what? From the model you got from aligning your RNA-seq data. And why wouldn't you have RNA-seq data mapping to that specific region of the genome? Because you sequence the wrong tissue. Probably, it is a possibility, yeah, that that region that didn't have any, any reads mapping to there, yet yeah, wasn't actively transcribed in the tissue type and development stage or the epigenetic background that you are working here. That doesn't mean it's not active ever. It just means that for this particular library, it wasn't active. So the fact that you can create a model and use it to identify these regions, even though they have no reads mapping, it means that it is potentially coding, even though you don't have any external proof to show it. So right now we're going to take a look. Oh, this is what an alignment will look like. Uh, don't mind the transcript models that are up here. This is the coverage. This is how reads look uh, aligned when you align them to a reference genome. You will see that in contrast to a genome uh, mapping, well, we didn't do that, but usually in genome mapping, you will see that the coverage is pretty even across all the regions in the genome because every region was represented equally. Yeah, but in this case, each region has peaks and valleys. The peaks are the most active 
transcribed regions in the genome, which represent genes or transcribed genes. The valleys, the ones with very low coverage, are the ones that are not represented enough. They are very low because they are either they have either low expression values that we didn't capture because we didn't sequence deep enough, or because they are transcriptionally inactive. In my library. In another library under a different treatment, these regions could be active. But in this library in particular, they are not. So we can use this information to predict what will be the structure of our genes. I'm not sure if it's visible from there. It's hardly visible from here. But here or there are detecting introns. They're detecting start codon. They're detecting the orientation of the, of the transcripts. And these are just proposals. These are, these are hypothetical transcripts that can be reconstructed from the way the reads align to the reference genome. And that these hypothetical transcripts, we know the coordinates for them. So since we know the coordinates from them that we get from the alignment, we can construct genome annotation files. <coughs> so now let's go to our hands-on. If you open your INEA08 directory that you should have shared in your Linux, So what I've done here, if I, it's that I've simulated some reads. These reads are already clean because we've already done this and I don't want to repeat these steps. Uh, these have already been checked with FASQC. They have been cleaned. So they don't have any adapters left over. They're all high quality. Yeah, but we have simulated different expression patterns. <laughs> Excuse me. Different expression patterns. For this, I have downloaded three important uh, files. The first one is the Arbiopsis Italiana uh, Tire 10 DNA top level FASCA. That is the chromosomes, the genome assembly of Arabidopsis taliana versus ten, version 10. <coughs> In the same way, I've downloaded all cDNAs. That is the transcripts. The, tran the transcripts that have been described or that have been annotated in the Arabidopsis taliana tire 10 or version 10, version 10 DNA. And I've downloaded the sequence of those, uh, of those genes. This would be the transcriptome of, Arab of Arabidopsis taliana. <coughs> and finally, I downloaded this Arabidopsis taliana tire 10.42.dff3. That is the annotation file that describes how each of these transcripts is found in the reference genome. It has information about introns, exons, start codons, and codons, 5 prime UTR, 3 prime UTR, etc. If you want to take a look at it, you can bin into it. But be aware, these are very lar large files, so For example, just the GFF3 file, it's 106 megabyte, mega, megabases long. The actual genome is 117 megabases long. Still pretty close. Sorry? It's a huge GFF, yes. It might have a, a lot of comments on and also, I think it has like uh, non-coding, non-coding information. <coughs> Will I be able to open it? Oh. Yeah. Yeah. 
So yeah, for example, I just gave you an example of what the GFF3 file looks like from columns one to column eight. It's pretty straightforward. Oh, why can I? Oh, the last part is PT is plastid. So it's a, it's a plastidial genome. But you can do the same with the beginning of it. For example, that number one means sequence number one, which will be chromosome one in a radio system in a genome. Yeah, they just use a single number to represent the molecule that is uh, that is being analyzed, that is being annotated. Yeah, and it got a straight away information. Uh, what did they use for notation? R port eleven. What kind of annotation this first line is? It's a gene. From where to where? From 3631 to 5899. Uh, what was this? A score. It's a period. They didn't. They didn't bother to put a score in, to it. The strand is a plus, so it's in the in the in the plus strand. Uh, why do you have phase as a period? Because it's not a CDS feature. Then the second one. It's a messenger RNA. It goes from the same start point as the gene, 3631 to 5898, the same in, uh, the same information, yeah. And then you start going through each of them, five prime UTR. It is just the beginning of the gene, the first exon. The the first CDS is contained within the first exon, but it's not exactly the same overlap. It's a fraction of the exon. It's the CDS. Because you have in this first section, you will have all these promoter regions, all this contact uh, with the ribosome that let it let the ribosome find the right spot where to start the translation. <coughs> then after that, after the first exon and CDS, you will see that all exons and CDS start and end at the same position. It's just the first exon and CDS that don't exactly overlap. We've just discussed why. And also, well, the last one as well. Yeah, the last CDS and last exon, they also do not exactly overlap. They start in the same position, but they finish in different positions. The CDS is shorter than the exon. Why? Because the exon has signals that tell the that are not translated, that are interpreted by the ribosome as a. Hey, this is where you stop. And this is where you start polyadenylating. lading. Oh, sorry. This is or just stop uh, transcribing, uh, tra translating. And then we have another gene. Once this finishes, we have the three fr prime UTR, which coincides with the, with the last part of the exon after the last CDS. And then we have gene two, another gene in a different uh, region. This one finished in 5899. This one starts a thousand days per later. Yeah, and go on, uh, and on and on it goes. And this is the same for each of the chromosomes in the RDLT genome, and the mitochondrial genome, and the plastic genome. All these are present in the RDLT reference genome. So this is an annotation file. Now, we're going to see what the corresponding ninth line is. I didn't put it there because it was too long. And it's still too long. So you see, for example, the first line after these three hashes, yeah, three hashtags, yep, we have the first gene, the one that we had annotated is called ID, gene, this one. Name, this one. The ID is different from name. Yeah, the ID has to be unique for each GFF file. It cannot be repeated. Whereas the name, two different genes in the same GFF file, can have the same name, basically because you could have parallax. The biotype, what kind of, of, of gene this is? This is a protein coding gene. Description is an NAC domain containing protein, which has a uniprot KB, a Swiss prot percentage of, uh, no, this is a, a special signal that says that the, the accession. This should be translated to a different character here. Uh, the gene ID, it's 81G01010. Logic name, R-Port 11. So, all 
additional information that you can get. If you go to the transcript, which is the second one, it, the, ID, the ID name, also unique, is transcript at one which means that this is the first transcript from this gene. Remember that you can have more than one kind of transcript per gene. Why? Because you have alternative splicing. I think I didn't mention that, did I? <laughs> I just remember that. So the next one, look, parent. This is what we're discussing. This is to establish the hierarchy. Which is the parent of this subfeature? This transcript belongs to gene 81G01010, which is the one we just described above. The nice thing about these GFF3 files is that they're usually sorted by coordinates. So a block of different annotations usually belong to the same uh, bigger feature, which would be a gene. So this is what a GFF3 file looks like. Now, let's take a look. at the DNA. These are the molecules. Since we're not going to be able to open this easily, we're just going to explore it. And for this, I'm going to use my good old friend Greb. In Arabidopsis Italiana 10 DNA, top level FA. There we go. So we see that in total, we only have, in the entire genome, we only have seven sequences. That's it. Only seven sequences, which represent chromosome 1, chromosome 2, 3, 4, 5, mitochondrial genome, and plastidial genome, chloroplast genome. You can see that the name, the, the, the characters before the space this is the name of the molecule. That's why in your GFF3 file, it appears as 1, 2, 3, 4, MT, or PT. Because only this space, this portion before the name, or before the space, it's the name of the sequence. After the space, this is a description. It's not taken as, a, as the actual name of your sequence. It's just a description. And it tells you, for example, what is it? This is DNA from a chromosome. What chromosome? It's a tire one that goes from position one to position, I think it's three million, 30 million, 30 million, 427,671. And it's a fair reference. Yeah, and it's the same for each of all of them. Yeah, each one will have its own, uh, its own details. Yeah, but these are all the five sequences that are present in my reference genome. Where is it? Oh, this one? Yeah. Oh, uh, I, I think I've mentioned this before, but you remember the FASTA format, right? The FASTA format has uh, first a name, and the name is des designated by a greater than sign. That's how you know that's the line of the name, right? If I want to read from a file only the names of the sequences, yeah, I select that, this greater than. And the fact that I'm using this, uh, how do you call this symbol? I don't know the other symbol, but the one that looks like a hat. Yeah? That symbol, to grip, it means the start of a line. So here I'm telling grip, please find me all the lines that start with greater than. That's what I'm telling grip here. I could just omit the start with. It's just that I like to be thorough. Um, yes, so this is what I'm telling you. From this file, Ardopsis Aliana Tire 10 DNA Top Level .fa, I want you to select all the lines that start with a greater than sign. Now get me those. The grep stands for get regular expression. So yes, that's how I know how many sequences in total are. The sequences can be huge, yeah, but there are only seven sequences. Now what if we just wanted to count this? We've already seen this. If, just, if we just wanted to know how many sequences are in total, 
we just all we need to do is pipe it to a command like word count minus l, which will count the number of lines I'm producing. So in this case, I know it's seven, but just to be sure, seven. Now, what if we do the same with the CDN8? Please try it. Exactly, it's never going to finish. That's not the best way to look at it. But if we just stop it at some point, if you want to stop it, just control C. And you can stop it. Yeah, you will see that. You're getting each line, it'll give you a name, and the name has a lot of description. For example, this one is the 81G335.0.2. Uh, it's a cDNA uh, from the chromosome tar one, tar 10, uh, 1. It goes from here to here. The gene, original gene name is this one. The gene biotype is a protein coding, and you have pretty much the same information you had in your DFF3 file, except for a little more detail. Description. Description is an unknown protein. It has 30,201 blast hits to 17,322 proteins. So somebody has already run a blast of it, of course. Yet in 780 different species that uh, comprise archaea, bacteria, metazoa, fungi, plants, virus, and other eukaryotes. Interestingly, the most common one is metazoa. Metazoa is an animal? Huh, interesting. Yeah. Uh, other eukaryotes. What is the source? NCBI blink. Um, this is your source. Tire accession number 81G335 double zero. So you have a lot of information. The names are huge. Who could tell me how many transcripts I have in that, or how many sequences I have in that, uh, in that file? I like it, yes. There are two ways, of course, right? There are always, there's always more than one way to do it. You could do the same thing I just did. Yep, a little over 48,000. Yeah, or you could, do, you could go the way of some tools that we saw the last time. Some tools, FedEx. This little fellow here. And once the index is finished, we can simply count the number of lines it has. So some tools will create this file here that we can see. We can head it. And we see that there is one line per sequence. So we just count that. Again, 48,359. Okay. Yes. Sorry, yes. Can you just do MKD here? Yeah. 08? Ah. Not by the way. If any, is anybody else having trouble mounting their devices? Sharing, sharing directories between your Linux and your Windows? So the first step we're going to be starting from is aligning your reads. Aligning your reads. Okay. Now, you will notice that by default, you have some aligners already installed. That's in BioLinux. There are two types of aligners. Okay? The first aligner is those that are gap unaware. For example, bow tie two. You know what I get? 
<laughs> for example, both I2. Both I2 is an aligner. If, yes. Yes. No set for the output, you create it. I, I, I think I think I think. Yes, so neither of some two fitted top level. Look at what you want to use DNA top level, dot FA. And you're trying to open CDNA all FA. Yeah, tap it, tap it, tap it, tap it. I think you have dot FA in dot FA dot F dot I. This is the one you created. If you want to create the phi, the pasta index file for your cDNA, you have to run this sum tools command on that cDNA. Oh, you haven't done that yet. You've done it on the on the top level DNA. Yes. Yep. Oh yeah. Yeah, no, that's a script. You have to do this. It's really fast. So you do have the bow tie too, right? Both I2 is a gap unaware aligner. Yeah, which means that when you have your reads, it will map them, it will align them to a genome. Yeah, but it will only map reads that don't have to be split in, into different places. It will align them to a single position, consecutive. So if you were to use both I2 to map your RNA seq reads, Against what would you align them? Against the genome or against the transcriptome? The transcriptome, exactly. Right? So let's just do that first. Okay? For all of you, by the way, I have created a, just a toy set, which is already quality filter and trim, under the same INEA 08 directory. These are all the samples. Sample 1, sample 2, sample 3, sample 4, sample 5, and sample 6. These have been converted from FASTQ to FASTA, just to save memory. Because alignment can be quite, cons uh, it, it can be quite consuming of resources, right? Even though the aligners have improved quite a lot, yeah, we're still trying to optimize for every single laptop that we have here because we're running locally in your laptops. Yeah, and since we have such different in hardware, then we have to keep it as a toy example only. Okay? So, what we've done is we have created this dumb uh, toy set. It would be pretty, it's pretty much the same thing you would get from an RNA seq uh, from RNA seq data, yeah. The only difference is that instead of fast A, you get fast Q. Uh, instead of fast Q, you're getting fast A data. So we just remove the qualities. And second, this has already been fast QC and trimmed. That is, low quality stretches have been removed. Adapters are not present. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The only thing is what to do with it now. And as we mentioned just a moment ago, we have two choices. We either assemble it de novo or we align it. And that depends on what resources we have available. In this case, we have all the resources available because it's, it is Arabidopsis saliana, and everybody has worked with that. Everybody. So you have both transcriptome and genome. They're both available. We can use either to map our reads in this case, we're going to use bowtie, bowtie 2, to map the, the reads and align them to the transcript of genome. So what are the steps to align reads to a transcript of genome, or oh, any reads to a reference sequence? The first step is to index your sequence. Just like we did with BLAST, we need to index our sequence. How we do we do that? Easy. Bowtie 2, 
build. Voltage 2 build is a tool of the Voltage 2 package that is designed to build indices from uh, reference genomes. These indices are the ones that we need to actually run the alignment. If we don't produce these indices, then we cannot map our reads to reference genome. Okay, so since this is the first time we're going to use it, let's go for the help. The help is pretty extensive. It's almost like half a page. But if you really want to see like a lot of details, I don't know, maybe for both sides too. Well, this one doesn't have that many details. But it gives you the most necessary parameters that you need to give it. Here in usage, it tells you, bow tie to build in square brackets options, which means that they, all the options are optional. You don't have to use them, but you're allowed to use them. And then these are the two positional important, important uh, arguments. First one, the reference we're going to use. Second one, the index base name. How the index is going to be named, how we're going to use it. Okay, so in the most simple scenario, what we're going to do is just put the name of our sequence, which should be Aurobsis taliana tar cdna fa and just name the output whatever we want. For example, in my case, it would be transcript. Sorry. Sorry for the typos. You can call it whatever you want. I'm just using transcript to make a clear difference between the original FASTA sequences and the actual index that I'm going to use. Often enough, this is all you need to do. You don't need to play with any of these options. But every once in a while, it will be necessary that you look into those options to see how they can improve your mapping efficiency, your, well, the, the, all the different metrics that you have. So just enter, and it's going to start. Please do it now, because it's going to take a little, uh, a little while, perhaps a few minutes. Yes. Yes. The samples, yeah. Yeah, those are your sequences. A kind of, kind of, yes. You could. You could get it from those. You could get this. Yeah, but the Arabidopsis uh, transcriptome of the Arabidopsis genome has been so extensively curated manually, yeah, that using just the tools we're talking about here, yeah, you wouldn't get the same result. They've been thoroughly reviewed and overviewed, and a thousand different tools have been used, and they've been curated using Sanger, using a, oh, different technologies, all at the same time, just to get this final set of gene of transcripts, and these transcripts. The, the ones that appear in your transcriptome uh, uh, reference, yeah, they belong to all tissues at all development, developmental stages of that the scientists have thought of, yeah, and even genes that don't have external data, they also have been annotated. Just using uh, statistical models. So you'll notice that it will take a little while. If, if I had been smart enough, I would have checked that there is a threats option to speed it up, but I wasn't, so we're stuck with using just one thread for indexing. Sorry? Does it have one? No, it doesn't. I wish it did. But and installing star is just way too complicated. I don't know if there are binaries or for star. 
binaries available for a star. I think you have to compile it. I think. But yes. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. Yeah, but the other thing is that the other reason why I wouldn't use a star is because of the memory of them. There are some that have three gigs of memory or two gigs of memory, so a star may not work if you want to map it to reference to one of the I'm even hesitant that my map is going to run to the RLC genome. So yeah, you see, this is, this is very verbose. It will finish someday today. So do you have any questions about what we're doing right now? Yep. Only if it's close enough. If it's close enough, you can. Yes. Uh, quite often, uh, for close enough uh, species, you can map RNA seq reads from one species to another. Yeah, but if they're too far apart, you can't. But you try. You will see this in, in genomic reads. If you have whole genome shotgun reads, and you map them, for example, between uh, wheat and aridops and uh, brachyponium, you will see that the reads that fall on the exons, yeah, they can still be mapped. Even though they are very different species and they have, like, I don't know, a few million years of of, of evolutionary history, or uh, divergent evolutionary history, yeah, the exons can still be mapped. Yeah? But the other regions, the intern regions, the non coding regions, those are a different, a different monster altogether. Yeah? No, it's working well. You just have to be patient, sorry. There you go. You're finished. It's so nice. Yep? Mm -hmm. No, that's what that's what I was telling you is that uh, the pre-processing step of cleaning up the reads is pretty much the same that we already did for genome assembly. We run PASQC, we check the quality, we run trim with SQL, but we could, you could use Trimomatic, you can use a cut adapter. There are a, a bunch of different tools. Yeah, but the idea is to get rid of low quality stretches and also adapters. Yeah. In the, in the specific case of, of, of RNA-seq, you may want to check if you have ribosomal RNA. It just in the specific case of, of RNA-seq, you may want to check if there is ribosomal RNA. Why? Yes. But this is only if you're planning to do assembly. Because if you're planning to map them, yeah, the ribosomal genes will be on the genome or in the reference transcriptome. And therefore, when you map all those reads, you're going to get rid of them. And you will be able to count the number of reads in all other in the, all the other genes. But if you try to assemble, the ribosomal RNA will overwhelm the assembler. Will be way too much compared to all other reads, all other transcripts, and therefore you won't be able to assemble properly. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. I was looking. I was looking for the same graph right now, which is that I, I don't have the time to start looking for it again. Uh, but basically, the, the tabs are going to be the same. There's just going to be a few differences in some of the tabs about the quality. Uh, but I can look for it, it just in a little while, and I'll show it. Yeah. But yeah, the, the, the way the way it looks, it's pretty much the same as in DNA, except for a few of the parameters that will don't look like a whole genome shot. For example, the number of duplications is going to look higher in rna seq because you, you have fewer, uh, you have more duplicated or more sequences that are duplicated, which are that the transcripts are more expressed than others, right? So that's going to reflect in the duplication metric. Also, the DC content is not going to follow like a theoretical curve. 
there where you have an average uh, GC content across all the genome. It's not going to look like that. Why? Because you're selecting only transcription, transcript, uh, act, transcriptly active genes, right? And these do not have the same GC content as the overall genome. Uh, also, uh, the sequence composition uh, pervades. It's also going to change. It's going to peak a lot. You're not going to have that stable AT on top, GC on the bottom, that uh, spreads across all of the uh, all of the bases in the in the in the reads. No, because the, again, the composition of the sequence is different. So you have peaks and valleys all over the place. That doesn't mean your sequencing is wrong. It's just the way RNA seq behaves. Yeah, but basically we're starting from the point where we assume we've already done that because the steps are very similar to whole genome shotgun. Yeah. Even if you have some uh, some contamination, yeah, the steps for trimming, the tools used for trimming and quality clipping are the same. Those steps won't change. The only thing that's going to change is if you have R ribosomal RNA contamination and you're planning to do the genome assembly, you have to get rid of it. Yeah, but if you don't have ribosomal RNA, and, and the way you detect our ribosomal RNA contamination is by checking the number of duplications. If you have, uh, that's on the FASTQC, if you have in your FASTQC duplications that appear more than 1,000 times, yeah, that is signal of ribosomal RNA uh, contamination. And you need to get rid of that. But only if you're going to do the novo transcriptome assembly. If you're not, at the time of mapping, you're going to get rid of your ribosomal RNA. Yes? Yep, yep. Sure. Yep. Mm -hmm. the, the what? Yep. The first step is to create an index. Uh, the index of your of the reference you're going to use. Since we're going to use Bowtie, which is a gap unaware aligner, yeah, we need. Uh, Bowtie is, is the package. Bowtie 2. Bowtie 2. It's a package for uh, for sequence alignment. Okay. Yeah, it's one of the fastest and most accurate that are. Yep. So, well, we're just waiting. So, oh no, it finished. Oh, so has everybody finished indexing? Yeah. Have you listed the contents of your? Yes. And you've seen that that transcriptome file that you created. Yep. They are not readable. These are binary files. You can follow. Uh, can you, you can follow that command. It, you can follow that command. The command that it's on the last line. Yes. Oh, it's a zero. Don't worry. So, if you accidentally run it again, yeah, that means that you overread what you had already produced. So you need to wait until it finishes again. Sorry. Yeah. So be careful. Do not run this again. Yeah. So you've created a list of different files that start with the word transcriptome, all of them finished in the .btu, bt2 uh, extension, yeah? That is your index, it's, yes. So the index file that you created is a way that will accelerate the analysis of the alignment that you will do later on. Because if you have, let's, let's, let's imagine you have a for loop, yeah? You know what a for loop is now. And it had to go every time it had, when, when you want to make one alignment, it had to go all over all the entire, entire genome that you have. It would take ages. With indexing, you tell them, here, look at this line. This is where you will find it. So that's why you create this index file. It will accelerate your, uh, your alignment. So, be aware that these indices are not read are not human readable. If you if you've tried to head or tail it, you will see that 
you get weird signs yeah, that it's a binary file. Yeah, it is meant, as Dave said, to accelerate things, so we don't need to understand it, only the computer needs to understand it. But this is what we're going to use for mapping. And this is why I used a different name between the index I created and the original FASTA file that I used to create that index. Because the FASTA file is, from now on, not going to be useful. At least not immediately, not for the next step. For mapping, we are not going to use the FASTA file. We're just going to use the index. All right? So the next step, actually mapping. The next step is actually mapping. And for this, you're going to have a big help. The mapper itself is Bowtie 2. And if we just do a minus minus help, you will see a huge help file, which of course gives us a lot of control over how the al mapping algorithm actually works. But at the same time, if we're just beginners, it's going to cause a lot of confusion how to use each of those parameters. In this case, we're going to just use the most basic approach. We're not going to dive into each of these options because it's going to be overwhelming and it's going to be extremely time consuming and more often than not you don't need to play that much with those parameters but yeah this is all there is all of this these are your options so we go we got to the actual most basic options that we need to use on this and it's when you see the usage the usage tells tells you. Start with both I2, then set your options. All those options are optional, except for the ones that are outside of the of the square brackets, which are not optional. Minus x and something. Why is that bt2 dot uh, idx is is the index file name prefix. This is the name we use for the index. This is the first place we use it. And as we see, this is not optional. This is a mandatory argument. We need to provide it. Second, minus 1, minus 2, minus u. These are my reads. Minus 1 is going to tell you, yes, use these reads. That are the forward reads. Minus 2 is going to say, use these reads that are the reverse reads. And in case I don't have any of those, yeah, if I don't have paired and reads, I just have single reads, then use minus u, these reads, just single and reads. It is possible. It's not recommended to use unpaired data anymore, yeah, but you may have some budget constraints that, pre that, that make it prohibitive for you to get parent data, so you just went for single and data. Oh, do they? Oh, I didn't know that. And finally, minus s sum. This may sound a bit confusing, but sum is the format for alignment. Sum is the format for alignment. It's a very complex format. It has headers, it has aligners, it has a lot of comments, it has a lot of annotations to each of the alignments. Yeah, but this is the most commonly used, the most widely used alignment for alignment format that you will find in the literature. Pretty much every single paper that uses mapping yeah, will have used some and some tools to process those alignments and to show and to upload those alignments. Pretty much every pipeline that depends on alignments from genome-wide experiments will use some alignments in order to, uh, as the input for downstream analysis. For example, for RNA-seq, differential gene expression, you're going to use some alignments in order to first filter low-quality mapping and then count the number of reads for each of the features and produce a, uh, a gene count table. That is, 
we count the number of reads that have aligned to each of the genes in my genome. And that's the table we're going to use to actually compare the different groups that we're testing. Yeah? Uh, in network analysis, how do you use the mappings? Or you just use the, the gene count? The gene count. Yeah? If you want to do the annotation, the annotation, geno uh, genome annotation, will take these alignments from RNA-seq and will determine with which are the high coverage regions that are most likely to be exons. So it takes that information from the SAM alignment. So all this information can come from the SAM alignment. So this is the output of this program. The SAM alignment is the output of this program. And it is important that you get it. Minus S and the output file. So since this is a toy set, and this is the minimum information we need to show. Oh, come on. You give me everything you can. Okay. So the first parameter was minus x. And we used transcriptome. Right? That was our index. The second parameter was minus 1. And we are going to do it for every single uh, sample. Yeah? But in this case, we're going to use sample one for what reads. Minus two, the same thing, sample one, but reverse reads. And minus s is going to be sample one dot sum. Now, we're likely going to have to specify the format of my input. Because we're not using FASTQ data as you, you, you would usually use. We're using FASTA data, which means it's missing the quality characters. Yeah, so here it is. Minus Q. The query input files are in FASTQ format, which is not true. We're using minus F. The query input files are in multifasta format. This is the one, the one flag that we also need to do. So here, at the beginning, we use minus f. That's it. You don't need to specify anything else but that flag. Say minus f, and you're telling Bowtie, by the way, the input data, the reads, are going to be in FASTA format, not in FASTQ format. And why do we put it at the beginning? Because, as you saw in the help, here, all the options that are not these ones here, all the options that are not the index file, the reads, and the sum output should be placed exactly after the command, both I2. So that minus F is part of those optional options. Yeah, and since we're activating that minus F, it's going here. And after that minus F, only you get minus X, minus 1, minus 2, minus S. Is this clear? All right, it shouldn't take you too long to finish the, the alignments. Just press Enter. If you have any errors, double check that there are no typos. Double check that there are no... Ah, again, you see? I'm, I'm, I'm this distracted. I forgot, forgot about this. Sorry. If you have more than, more than one thread available, you might want to use it. So again, here, just take a look at minus P threads, just to speed it up. Minus P, 4. There we go. That should have speed it up a little bit. Yeah, it's always better if you can use several cores or several threads.
There we go. Finished. Very quickly. And it gives you some stats. These are important stats. First, it tells it how many reads there were. In total, there were 59,577 reads. Why were there? Okay. Reads. All of them were paired. So in, actually, we had twice as many reads. But in each of the files, we had 59,000 reads. Of these, zero aligned concordantly zero times. So everything was mapped. No? Aligned concordantly zero times. Yeah, everything was mapped. 46% aligned concordantly exactly one time. What does this mean? This means that these reads were mapped to the genome to one position and one position alone. There is not a secondary place in the genome where these genes could have come from. All right? And 53% of the reads align concordantly more than one time. So that means that these reads could have come from at least two different positions in the genome. This happens, as we mentioned, because of the presence of parallels or the presence of uh, conserved motifs between different family proteins. Uh, now, zero pairs align concordantly zero times, and zero paints align zero times concordantly. concordantly. This, well, the rest is just zero, which means that the last line, this is important, 100% of the reads were aligned to the reference genome. All my reads were aligned. Sometimes, when you're using a reference genome that is not the same as your uh, as the species that you're using, you will not get 100%. You will get maybe 95, 96, 92, 91. The farther away evolutionarily you use, uh, the farther away the, the reference and your sequences are evolutionarily, yeah, the fewer reads are going to map. Also, if you have if you have contamination in your library that doesn't correspond to the same species you're using as a reference, then those reads are not going to align. Therefore, you'll have lower mapping efficiency. If you have adapters leftovers, yeah, if these are small pieces, you will get alignments. But if the adapter contamination is too big, yeah, those reads are not going to be aligned to the genome, at least not using both I2. So all these things are things that we need to take into account. And finally, what is an alignment? What are we finding when we align a read to a reference sequence? Does this mean that we have found the perfect place for the read where this read was originated? No. We are finding the most likely place. There is an error associated with the statistic of how likely it is that the read came from this position. Or in other words, how likely it is that the coordinates where the read has been mapped to yeah, are incorrect. And it uses the same metrics as the thread qualities. Is if the probability of a read being mapped to the incorrect to an incorrect position, yeah, is one in ten, then your mapping quality is going to be ten. If your the the probability of your read mapping to the wrong position or being mapped to the wrong position is one in one hundred then your mapping score is going to be 20. If it's 1 in 1,000, your mapping score is going to be 30. So not only do you have now a quality score for each of your bases, once you finish mapping, and this is what we call probabilistic mapping, yeah, now you have also an associated mapping quality. The mapping quality will be affected by the level of repetition of, the, uh, of that region in the genome. It's also going to be affected uh, by the uniqueness of the mate pair 
of the mate of, of the pair sequence that comes along with the original sequence. Uh, it's going to be mapping by low base, uh, low base quality in your reference. It's going to be affected uh, by sequencing errors. It's going to be affected. Uh, right now, I can't think. I can't think of anything else that affects uh, map quality. But basically, remember, this is a probabilistic model. Since you're doing a fast alignment using indices, and you're just uh, at, at the first stage, you're just looking for short. Uh, short matches across the genome and you're trying to start with seeds and extend your, your, your alignment in a specific seed or a specific position, yet yeah, there is a chance that the alignment was wrong. There is a chance because you didn't explore the whole genome while aligning your reads. So since you didn't explore the residue, you just, from all the samples you got across the genome or across your reference, you found this as the most likely spot, yeah, and you uh, and the and the and the aligner both I two drop it. Yes, this is the one that we consider is the best place for it to be, and we align we assign this much quality to it. But yes, effectively, this is what happens. Each mapping position will have a probability associated with it, a probability of it being wrong or a quality. This is something to keep in mind, because this will also introduce some errors or some bias into our analysis. So now that we did that for, yes? Oh, yeah, we're going we're gonna to get into that in just a second. Let's just quickly see that we've generated a sample 01.sum file. This, at this point, it's a text file. So you can, you can beam into it, you can open it. You can use the head, you can use the, the tail, you can use all the regular tools that you use to explore a file. No, for, from something as simple as just counting the number of, of lines, yeah, 167,000, yeah, to something as simple as just looking at the head. or the tail. The sum alignment, it's a complex one. Basically gives you all the information you need to know about how the alignments were performed and where each of the reads was aligned, how good was the alignment, and the coordinates, the number of mismatches, the number of indels, Etc. All that is represented in each of the of the lines of the of the sum file. It is big and it's not meant to be read like I'm showing you. It's not meant to be treated like that. I'm just showing you so that you know that it can be represented by a text file. It could be read, yeah, but nobody's gonna read a million lines or a hundred and sixty thousand lines with their eyes. Nobody well, if somebody's doing it, you should stop, and you should use uh, a computer. Yeah, but uh, the only thing that you need to know at this point is that uh, the first lines in a sum file that start with at, those are called headers. Yeah, and it gives me some information about the alignment as a uh, overall. It tells me, for example, if it, 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 the alignment has been sorted by coordinates or not, which for example in this case it's not. Yeah, it tells me what were the sequences that were included in the reference, that were present in the reference in, in the reference genome. That's it. You have a list of all the sequences. After you finish the sequences, you can add additional information. For example, what read group it belongs. For example, if you have this kind of test where you, you're doing differential gene expression or you're comparing a control against a, a test case, yeah, you can say uh, all these libraries be belong to, the, to this group and belong to this library. And you can add that uh, uh, as headers in your SAM file, telling it this, be, uh, this, this alignment file belongs to this library, which belongs to this group. Um, after the headers finished, all those lines that start with at, 
yeah, you have the actual alignment itself. Yeah, and the alignment itself There we go. It's just beautiful. There is a, a big document explaining what each of the columns um, uh, represents in the alignment, how it should be read, yeah, and uh, what can be added. So we'll just go to the actual this is the header section, the one that I was telling you about. And now we go to, yes, the alignment section. You have 11 mandatory, uh, 11 mandatory columns in every alignment. Each of these lines is going to be written at least once per read. So if you have 100,000 reads, you will have 100,000 lines at least. 100,000 alignments. If a read wasn't aligned, you still write a record for an aligned an align read saying it wasn't aligned. Yeah, so we couldn't find any position in the reference used to map this read. Yeah, but you still write it. So what are the fields? The first column, the name of the query. That is the name of the read. Yeah. The second column, the flag. These flags tell me a lot of information about uh, about my sequence. For example, it tells me if there are multiple segments in the sequence. For example, parent sequences. You have two segments per, per template. It tells me if each segment is properly aligned according to aligner or not. That is, if they are in the right direction and they have the expected insert size between both ends. They tell me if the current segment that we're, that we're analyzing, the current alignment, is mapped or unmapped. It tells me if the next segment of the alignment is mapped or unmapped. It tells me if the alignment occurred in the forward strand or the reverse strand. So if, it's, if the sequence has been reverse complemented or not. It tells me if the mate, that is the pair, yeah, was reverse complemented or not. It tells me if uh, this is the first segment, that is the forward reads, or if these are the reverse reads. See, first segment in the template, last segment in the template. It tells me if it is a secondary alignment, so sometimes you will find more than one place where your reads could have come from. Yeah, those are secondary alignments. Yeah, so it tells me that if you have two records for one read, one of them is going to be a secondary alignment. Uh, then, not passing filters like platform uh, or bench uh, platform or vendor quality controls. That is, they still gave you the reads, and you map them without doing any filtering, trimming, etc. So the quality of the reach is really poor, and this will turn on this kind of, uh, of flags. It tells me if it's a PCR or optical duplicate. This is what we talk when we discuss uh, sequencing platforms. Sometimes you get optical duplicates just because uh, one read in one bit got entangled with the next bit, and you have two populations of clones, one next to the other one. And finally, supplementary alignments. This is what you expect to find when you have gapped alignment. Because one read will map one part in one region and the other part in another region. That's a supplementary alignment. So this is the, the this is just, we're just talking about the second column. All this information is stored in the second column alone. Yeah? Now we have to jump into the third column. There we go. Third column, our name, which is the reference name. It's the name of the sequence where the mapper mapped the read. If we map it to chromosome 1, here you'll have a 1. If you map it to chromosome 2, here you'll have a 2. 
the position. This is the coordinate. The one base left nose mapping position of the first cigar operation. Oh, forget about the cigar operation. This is just going to be a nightmare. Just, <laughs> just keep in mind that this is the leftmost position of the alignment. The, the leftmost position of the alignment. If it's forward or reverse, it doesn't matter. We're talking about the leftmost position. So where the alignment starts. Uh, then we have fifth column, map Q, mapping quality. As we saw, it's uh, equal to minus 10 uh, times the logarithm of the probability of the mapping position being wrong. So there is a direct correlation between the mapping quality and the probability of it being wrong. And it transforms pretty much the same way we were discussing. If you have a 1 in 10, that is 10% chance of being wrong, you have a, a mapping quality of 10. If you, the probability is 1 in 100, a mapping quality of 20. If the probability is 1 in 1,000, a mapping quality of 30, and so forth. It's in, it's in a logarithmic scale. Six columns, cigar. <laughs> cigar, it's what we call cigar operations. Uh, this is a way to describe, base by base, how the sequence aligns to reference. If there was an indel, if there was, uh, if there was an insertion, if there was a deletion, if there was a mismatch, yeah, these are meant to be represented in this cigar stream. So, if you don't have the original sequences of your reads, you can get them back from the alignment. If you, by chance, remove the, re the original raw reads that you had, you can get those sequences back from the alignment. Our next is the reference where the next pair has been mapped. So if we have parent sequences, it is possible that one read map to one reference sequence and another, map, uh, another read map to a different reference. Why? Because our assembly was incomplete. We didn't have chromosomes, we had scaffolds, and therefore some scaffolds may be close to each other. And if my scaffolds are close to each other, there is a chance slight but there is a chance that one read maps to one scaffold and the other read maps to another scaffold and forms a bridge there is this chance there is also the other chance that one of the reads was incorrectly mapped next one p next is the position of the next segment in the template that is if we're using forward in what position is the, the, the reverse mapping. It's the same information as, as for the first one. We have reference and position, and now we have the reference and position of the next pair in the pair. Uh, T length, this is the template length. So, when we were discussing pair dents, we know that we selected a size, and the best thing we could do is sequence from the extremes. Sometimes the template is small enough that by sequencing from the extremes, we can get an overlap. But other times, we don't. We just have 100 base pairs here, 100 base pairs from the other end, and, and you have like a 100 base pairs of white sequence. You don't know what's in the middle. You can estimate the length or the distance between the forward and the reverse based on their mapping positions. And that's what this is about, the ninth column. 10, the sequence, the segment sequence. This is the sequence of the alignment. If there are bases that have been clipped by the aligner, which happens, in, for some aligners, they, they do it. They do hard clipping or soft clipping. But if there are bases that have been clipped, these are not going to be represented in these segments, in the sequence segments. Then the quality, the quality of each of these sequences. 
And that's it. Those are the 11 lines, the 11 columns of, a, of an alignment format. So what you're seeing here, it's just that. First column, the name of the read. Second column, the bits. This gives a lot of information about whether it's the first pair, the second pair, whether it's mapped, it's not mapped, if it's properly mapped, if it's all those that we read at the beginning, yeah, are represented in just numbers. I'm not going to get into how these numbers are decoded. Yeah, then the reference, where was it aligned? What reference? It's 81GF.1, one of the genes. Uh, then we have the position. The position is 57. So that means that this read here aligned to this transcript here in position 57 forward. Uh, second, 42, this is the quality. The quality or the probability of this being wrong is one in, four, in 10 thousand. So it's a low probability. It's very likely that this is the correct placement. Cigar, this 100 matches. That is that 100 base pairs that form the read were matched to this reference position. The equal, I don't remember what, was that, what that was. But yeah, you get the idea, right? Each of those fields have a different meaning. Yeah, and you can describe the, you can describe the alignment based on this line alone. Now what we're gonna do is gonna repeat the same step for each of the six libraries that you've got. You saw that it was really fast, right? So now I'm going to create a script, a small bash script. You just, we're just gonna copy it. Okay, yeah, all right, we have lunch. So we'll quickly write this up and let it run in while we have lunch. What do you think about that? So that we save a little bit of time. So yeah, yeah, good advice, David. So instead of running the, the for loop, uh, it's better to just do this. We're gonna run the same command over and over and over for every sample we have. Sample two, it's going to be reading into sample 02.sum. Sample three, into sample 305. You put all of this into a file. This is gonna be your bash script. The bash script, once you execute it, it's gonna for perform one line at, line at a time. Yeah, so that means that once it finishes the first alignment, it's gonna continue to the second alignment, it's gonna continue to the third alignment until it finishes. And we can just leave it running while we're having lunch. Uh, let me change the colors. Same, same uh, color before. Just copy and paste the same command that you just uh, wrote. Copy and paste it inside uh, a script that you created. You can use Beam, you can use Nano, you can use Get, you can use whatever uh, you want. You can just copy it. You can just go back to your, to your original uh, command line, select it, right click, copy, and then when you open your file, you just put uh, right click paste. El anterior era porque no le habías puesto un nombre de archivo. Está. Y ahora, va. Lo dejamos correr. Sí. WQ. Esc period WQ. Yeah, you have to make sure that you're not editing and then period to give commands WQ. I, I, I'm, I'm used to it. I do everything on this. Everything. Esc. No te preocupes, pero Esc se asegura ya que ya no estás editando. 
Ahora una vez que tú haces eh, dos puntos es para meter comandos. No, no baja con nada, solo mete dos puntos. Solo esos dos puntos y automáticamente cuando no estás editando va a la línea de comandos de bien. De doble, salvar, Q de, de salir. Enter. Ahí está. Ahora asegúrate que Map My Reads tiene lo que quieres. Sample 2, 3, 4, 5. Te faltó la 6. Sí, son 6. Agregalo uno más. Voy a poner BIM y agregalo una línea más. Ah, lo grabaste como MyBash SG o MyBash SH. <risa> Ahí está. Está debutando. Bash y este de acá, el, el archivo que acabas de... Ma, map my reads dot sh. Dot sh. Ajá. Básicamente está diciendo, ejecuta este, este archivo usando el interpretador bash. Ejecútalo. ¿eh? Yes. Yeah. ¿Qué pasó? Tranquila, es porque estás en insert. Estás en insert. Si quieres dejar de insertar o si quieres dejar de editar, es... Ahora aprieta Y, ahora P. No, para editar pones o la o letra I o aprietas insert. ¿Dónde les dije? Ustedes son más que capaces de ese. It's not taking too long. It was just a matter of copying a bit. Yeah. Yeah, 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 you're up to the right. It's it's much better like this. Is it executing? Oh, motion online exits with value one error. No input width files were valid. Ah, sí, hay algo, hay un typo acá. Sample. Ah, no, no es punto. Acá. Eso no es punto. Es uh, under underscore. No te preocupes. Es el que me gusta de BIM, hay una manera rápida de hacer todo. Substitute. Mm, tranquila. <risa> vamos a sustituir todo lo que dice sample punto por sample dancecore. ¿eh? Sample punto lo vamos a sustituir por sample dancecore. Ya está. Sí, ese, ese ya es con experiencia, es nada más una manera para, cuando quieres hacer reemplazos en todo un archivo, ya, incluso puedes hacerlo fuera de BIM, puedes hacerlo en, en set, pero si quieres hacer reemplazos, sustituciones, puedes hacerlo con, con comandos de lo que llaman regular expression, como crep. ¿No? Y está, enter. There you go. Y nada. ¿Qué tal ustedes? ¿Ya lo ejecutaron? ¿Terminó? Sorry, no digo. There you go. It's okay. It looks perfect. Everybody ready? Everybody ready? If you just submitted it, good on you. If it finishes, good on you. It's time to eat. What's wrong? Ah, okay, okay, okay. You're just you're still editing. Oh, okay. No, 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 wait. Both type 5, no, it should be both type 2 in every case. Because this is the command. The command is called both type 2. The only thing that changes is the sample math then. I remember this goes, it goes from 2 to 6. You're missing one line. Yep. Esc and then period WQ. Yes, that that that's incomplete. 
Ah, ya. No te preocupes. Si quieren escribir, ya aprietan I y les sale acá insert. Ya pueden escribir. Y la otra opción, ya. Cuando estás, cuando recién entras no tienes nada, ¿no? Agarras insert, el botón insert y ya le sale insert. Ahora, para dejar de editar, aprietas esc y ya no puedes. Lo, lo, a menos que vuelvas a apretar la, el botón I de casualidad, ya, ya, nada va a salir ah, otra vez. ¿no? Ya, esto eh, no, va, no va a funcionar. Si quieres, si quieres borrar una fila completa sin editar, o sea, cuando estás fuera del insert, agarras y haces DD. DD te lo borra. Si quieres copiar una, por ejemplo, supongamos que tienes acá la línea TTTT, ¿ya? Si quieres copiarla y pegarla, aprietas. Fuera de la edición, o sea, aprietas S y pones YY. Ese es un comando llamado Young. Y después Face, 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 Face. Y después lo vuelves a borrar. Ahí está. Por eso es más rápido. ¿Sí? Ah, errores en cada uno. Bacán. Sí, claro. Primero. Te dije que era Bowtie 2, no Bowtie solo. ¿Te olvidaste? ¿Ya? ¿Te importa? Acá está el toque. 2, 2, 2, 2, 2. Ah, sample 2, sample 3, sample 4, sample 5, sample 6. ¿Ya? ¿Eso es todo? Ya está. Sí, les voy a enseñar. Está bien, no importa. Uno, uno va aprendiendo. Eso, eso, ese truco lo aprendí hace creo que un mes. There you go. Perdón. What is wrong? No, no, no. Look, it's telling you there's an error. Map my reads doesn't exist. You create map my reads con nada. Y está tratando de ver map my reads.sh. Son diferentes.